Hey guys, Mrs. Horn here. I have some notes to give you on chapter 35. This is the first chapter for our plant unit. And our focus is to, to learn about the structures that are inside a plant that help it to sustain life. If we consider the body of the plant and how the environment or how its DNA has improved it, uh, we know that natural selection has caused plants to change in their shape and structure over time. Um, plants have uh, developed certain adaptations that have actually uh, enhanced their survival on land. We've talked in our evolution unit about life starting in the water and moving onto land. Um, the first plants weren't ready for a terrestrial environment um, and some of the things that they evolved over time were structures like reduced leaves um, in a cacti. Uh, photosynthesis in the cactus actually happens in the stem of the plant and not the leaf because the leaf is so small, it wouldn't be worthwhile. Um, but having those reduced leaves offers a reduced amount of water loss due to transpiration. We'll be doing a transpiration lab after we do chapter 36 this week. Other adaptations that plants have, there's an aquatic plant uh, there's actually a picture of it at the top of this page. It has very feathery leaves, uh, small and feathery leaves, and this helps to increase the surface area for the leaf, which allows it to take in a greater amount of carbon dioxide from the water. In areas where there is not a lot of rain, in a drought, um, plants release hormones that tell the stomata to close. When the stomata closes, it helps to minimize the water loss. Uh, we'll get into more detail of stomata later in, the, later in the chapter. Plants can be categorized into two different groups. They can either be monocots or dicots, and we look at differences among their roots, stems, and leaves to determine what group they are in. On the next page in your packet, you have a diagram. Um, one side is the monocot examples and the other side are the dicot examples. The first thing I want to look at are the flowers of the plants. Any monocot has petals that are multiples of three, so three, six, nine, twelve would be a monocot. A dicot flower would have multiples of four to five. If we were to look at the root system of both plants, the monocot would have a very fibrous root system. Um, lots of little small roots, there's no one big root that stands out, um, and lots of root hairs, whereas the dicot has one large root that is the main root anchoring into the ground, and off of that tap root would be um, smaller fibers and some root hairs. If we look at the vascular tissue, which we'll talk about this a little bit later in the chapter also, but there are vascular bundles that are arranged in the stem. So imagine a cross section of the stem. You were to cut a stem and look down into it. You would see these vascular bundles in the stem and I'm trying to point them out here with my cursor. Those, those little bundles are vascular tissue made up of xylem and phloem which moves water and food throughout the plant. Well in a monocot the vascular bundles are arranged very randomly. There's no pattern to it. They're kind of all over the place in the stem. Whereas in a dicot, the vascular bundles are arranged nice and neatly all the way around the stem in a ring formation. You can also look at the leaves of a plant to figure out if they're monocot or dicot, and if they have a parallel veins on their leaf, they are a monocot plant, whereas a net-like leaf would be a dicot plant. And the last thing we look at to compare monocots and dicots are seeds. If we look at the seeds, and the seed has only, it's, it's a whole seed. You can't break it into halves, it's just one whole piece. That's considered one cotyledon, that would be a monocot. That's why we call it a monocot, because mono means one, so for one cotyledon. And a dicot, dicot means two, for two cotyledons. A dicot seed has two halves for it, so it would split open. Um, an example for a cotyledon is corn. Corn is a really good example of, of a monocot seed. 
So next we're going to move into the root and shoot system of a plant. We're going to talk about what is, what are the roots and what do they do and what make them up and how do they move material from the roots up. So let's start with the roots. The roots help to anchor and absorb water. Um, they do that in the soil, from the soil. Um, most plants have what are called fibrous roots. Um, monocots are an example of a plant that has a fibrous root. They're very thin roots. They are spread very close to the surface, so the roots run very shallow. Um, and, and this type of roots helps to prevent erosion because as they run very shallow to the surface, they're holding in the soil um, that's close to the, it's close to the surface. Uh, we also just mentioned tap roots. Tap roots are a root that are commonly found in dicot plants. Um, it's one very large root with lots of lateral branches, branches that are reaching horizontally from the main root. Tap root is great for storing food. Uh, carrot is actually a good example of a tap root. They are a very firm anchor. Uh, they get their name from the fact that they will grow deep into the soil searching for a source of water, trying to tap that water source underground. Um, no matter what kind of root system a plant has, whether it be a tap root or fibrous root, um, they both will have root hairs. So dicots and monocot plants will have root hairs. Uh, root hairs, their whole purpose is to help increase surface area so that the root can absorb more water. And not only are they absorbing water, but they are also help they also help to absorb minerals, which are an, another important ingredient when um, carrying on photosynthesis. Um, there are also adventitious roots, and these are roots that run above ground. Um, they help in support. So there might be uh, a plant, uh, corn is a great example, that is very tall. And the root system that corn has alone would not support the height that um, corn has. Corn is actually a monocot, um, which means that it has only a fibrous root system. It doesn't have a, a tap root, which would offer a little more of an anchor. Um, so, it, so these type of roots grow above the ground. Um, and if you look really close at this, at, the, at a corn stalk, there are these roots coming out of the stem, growing right into the ground, and they look like, uh, like the stalk has a cane, almost. Um, into the shoot system. So as, as these waters and minerals are carried up into the stems, um, stems have uh, nodes, um, and from those nodes can grow different types of buds. Uh, this could be an auxiliary bud, which I spelled that wrong, it should be A-U-X. Um, there could be auxiliary buds, which these are buds which will be the beginning of a, of a new branch. Um, a terminal bud is the tip of the shoot, so at the very end of the stem, at the tip, is where a, um, a new stem might continue to grow. Off of the stem we have leaves. Leaves consist of a blade, consist of a petiole, which the petiole is where the leaf joins to the stem. Leaves can be considered compound or... The leaves are at the bottom of the page. They show different types of configurations for leaves. The first one here is a simple leaf, uh, one leaf, one stem. This is a compound leaf, so there are many single leaves off of one stem, which then connects to a major, uh, a larger stem. And then this is actually a double compound, so there are compound leaves that make up one larger compound leaf, which then attaches to a stem. So it gets a little more complicated um, as you go further along, further along the line. So now I want to talk about tissues that are inside of that shoot system um, that help to pr protect the outside of the leaf and the stem, but also help uh, transport materials. Uh, the dermal tissue is a, a, a layer that is a protective layer. This is on the outside of the stem and the leaf. The cuticle is is the protective layer and it's a, a waxy layer that's on the outside of the leaves and the stem and it helps to retain water so this is a, a great adaptation for all land plants all terrestrial plants 
aquatic plants typically don't have this because they want water to move freely in and out of the plant. Vascular tissue, this is going to be tissue that is moving material, whether it be uh, water or food, glucose. Um, vascular tissue will transport material between the roots and the shoots. Uh, one type of vascular tissue is called xylem. Xylem is designed to only transport water and minerals, but it's only transporting it up. It's only moving it in one direction. Tracheids and vessel elements are types of cells that make up the xylem. These cells are dead when they are mature. The other type of tissue, type of cells that uh, is a transporting in a, in a vascular tissue is phloem. Phloem transports food, the food that's made in the leaves, um, talking about glucose. It's made in the leaves and it will bring that food to the roots. It might bring it to the fruit and it might bring it to any new leaves that are growing off of the plant. Phloem is made up of cells called sieve tube members. These cells are conducting tubes. They are alive at maturity. These cells don't have a nucleus. Um, they don't have any ribosomes. They don't have any vacuoles. So they are, because the sieve tube cells don't have the nucleus, ribosomes, and vacuoles, they actually are paired up with other cells called companion cells. The companion cells are connected to the sieve tubes. They are non-conducting cells, and their purpose is to help load the sugar into the sieve tubes. They do have a nucleus, they do have ribosomes, they do have vacuoles, and those are adjacent to the sieve tube cells. So the sieve tube is simply the conductor, and the companion is the loader, but also has the nucleus and the ribosomes and the vacuoles that the sieve tubes are lacking. So in addition to the dermal tissue and the vascular tissue, plants also contain ground tissue. Uh, the pith and the cortex make up the ground tissue. The pith is internal to the vascular tissue, so that would be in the very center of the stem or the root. The cortex is, is the outside of the vascular tissue. Um, it's close enough to the outside of the stem and the, and the, and the leaf that it can carry on photosynthesis. Um, but does still help provide space for storage and support to the plant. Uh, there is a picture on page 7 in your packet that's not labeled. I would like you to go to the textbook and get the labels off of the diagram from the text so that you know uh, what the different vascular tissues are and, and where everything should be on the picture. I am going to stop the notes. Um, this, is, this is taking us about halfway through chapter 35, so this is going to conclude part 1 of chapter 35 notes. And I'll make another video to get us through the rest of Chapter 35 for tomorrow night. Uh, I hope this helps.